It is a great honor to welcome Ian Bruma on this podcast. He is a writer, a journalist, and an educator. And he recently had an article published on Harper's Magazine. It is titled Doing the Work, and the subtitle being The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Wokeness. How are you today, Ian? Thank you for joining us. Very well, thank you. Yes, let's begin with the uh, title of the article, which, um, you know, as I've heard, the title is often picked by the editors and the the writer himself may or may not have any input in it. But what does it mean to do the work? Well, uh, as you say, it was not the title. I, I didn't choose the title. Um, the, the author almost never does. Um, but what it means is that um, doing doing the work is... A religious term, really, um, uh, that it has existed for a long time. For example, uh, one of the, the more extreme Orthodox uh, organizations of the Catholic Church, the Opus Dei, literally means the work of God, and they talk about doing the work and so on. In the context of social justice activism, it means uh, the duty to constantly to 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 affirm uh, the. Uh, purity of what of, of a particular ideology and it means that it's not enough for example to be uh, anti-racism or to work to overcome racial prejudice or to improve society in various ways it means you have to affirm an ideological position which holds that um, all uh, social and economic uh, problems and 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 uh, inequality and injustices and so on are all um, uh, essentially due to systemic racism. And so, any voice of skepticism, any uh, opinion that perhaps says that perhaps not that's not the whole issue, and there are other issues to do with class and so on, uh, very quickly by the more extreme activists will be denounced as a form of heterodoxy. And so doing the work means that you constantly affirm uh, the truth of a particular uh, ideological position. Mm -hmm. So, um, of course, I mentioned that the subtitle mentions the Protestant ethic. And I think if one is familiar enough with the um, theological differences between Catholicism and Protestantism, you find that uh, Protestantism uh, emphasizes faith, uh, I think, in favor or uh, supersedes uh, work as a work ethic, but it's more of a yeah, it, it's more of a faith based uh, theological creed than a work based, um, um, I guess, um, yeah, creed. So, uh, how how does the Protestant ethic square with this uh, uh, continual effort of doing the work, so to speak? Well, the work ethic can mean different things. I mean, in this case, doing the work is is an ideological uh, position, or or an affirmation of faith. But um, the Protestant is Protestantism is not at all um, contrary to the work ethic. And I also quote in the article uh, the German sociologist Max Weber, who developed a theory uh, in the nineteen twenties, um, which argued that. Um, the reason, uh, as he thought then, that uh, northern Protestant countries were more successful at capitalism than the Catholic South or the Confucian uh, parts of East Asia uh, was that um, in the eyes of, of Calvinists and, and many Protestants, um, the worldly success and the accumulation of wealth through hard work uh, is a sign that you're blessed by God. Now, Weber was clearly wrong about many things, uh, including the fact that he thought that Confucian societies would be less successful at capitalism. As we know, they've done extremely well. But um, that was his position. And you see that still in, in, in American culture in many ways, where, uh, you know, you look at billboards for churches, in, especially in the South, and they're very similar to billboards for you know local banks. You know, invest in God, and you will be successful, and so on and so forth. And that goes back to uh, that that notion that um, success means you're blessed by God, and um, which fits in very well with the particular kind of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I think it's a very American thing to. Uh... 
uh, have uh, what you call prosperity gospel, i.e., the idea yes. uh, if if you uh, if you show or if you exhibit worldly success, then that means that you're blessed by God. Which is, if you really read what Jesus says, is profoundly anti-Christian. Well, it's 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 certainly a new departure from Christianity, and and one that that Catholics would never um, subscribe to. But um, uh, yes, uh, it is. It, it, it's not a, a faith that I myself uh, believe in. But um, mm -hmm. um, so one of the uh, one of the other points that you've mentioned in the in the essay is that um, the Protestant ethic, as you see it. Um, eschews this kind of monastic lifestyle or um, dispensation that uh, Catholics are familiar with, with St. Benedict and and more. Um, how, how do you explain the difference between uh, the two? Well, the, the, Protestantism was a rebellion against the, author, the hierarchical authority of the, of, the, of the church, of the priests, mm -hmm. and uh, the traditional Role of the priest, uh, which, which still is still very much uh, the case in 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 the Roman Catholic faith, is that the priest is the intermediary between the believer and God. You go through the priest in order to reach uh, God, and and Protestants rebelled against that notion and um, argued that um, every individual has a direct pipeline to God without the mediation of uh, of priests. And um, and that all that counts is the the faith itself and the letter and the literal interpretation of the Bible, not the interpretation of priests or a hierarchy of priests, which includes, as you mentioned, you know, monasteries and, and monks and so on and so forth. No, it's every individual for him, him or herself who um, establishes a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. So uh, you also mentioned the book um, Woke Racism by uh, John McWhorter of Columbia University. Yeah. And of course, it is no accident that he, one of the former names of the book uh, before it reached publication is called The Elect. And he calls people who are the high priests and priestesses of the woke ideology as the elect. And mm -hmm. these days, if you think about, say, democratic politics being elected mean, means being chosen by the people yes. or at least the majority of the people but yes. in the language of protestantism or especially uh, one derived by john calvin being of the elect means being chosen by god so yes. how how do you suppose how do you make the connection between uh, calvin's notion of the elect and uh, what uh, the woke ideologues uh, uh, perceive of themselves well it's it's not it's not a direct one-on-one -on -one. i mean it's not that 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 social activists uh that john mcwater calls the elect are exactly the same as as calvinists um and there are also differences within the the protestant religion on this i mean strict calvinists believe in predestination so whatever you do in life uh as a a, a believer a calvinist believer um, you go to heaven and everybody else is destined to go to hell. And many Protestants, even in the 17th century, believed that that was too harsh and that um, people, even people who did not, who were not Calvinists, um, uh, uh, might um, have a ticket to heaven just, you know, if they behaved well and, 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 and so on. And um, as you say, there is a difference between being the idea of being elected by God or being elected because of your superior virtue, which is the, the case with a lot of um, social activists, um, and um, being chosen in politics by, by an electorate. So the elect, as it's, uh, and I, I don't want to speak for him, but uh, as I, I see it, and as John McWhorter, I think, sees it, um, is that um, people feel elected to, to as as a sort of special class um, because they can claim superior virtue. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, um, you know, one can one of the many uh, well-known episodes of uh, Puritanism gone awry is uh, they often point to the Salem witch trials, and um, I read about it. And one of the key figures associated with it is. Um, 
the lawyer and scholar Cotton Mather, which um, he was particularly zealous in his denunciation of uh, so-called witches in that trial. And it shows that, um, it shows that one, the idea that we uh, we deem irrational, such as wokeism or puritanism in their time, uh, could be adopted by some of the smartest and most educated people. And secondly, the smartest and most educated people are often the most zealous in propagating these ideals. So, um, I guess um, to make the connection, why why does uh, why are some of the uh, the best and the smartest people in our society are the main ones uh, propagating these ideas we call woke? Well, that's a good question, and and this I think I think one should not make historical comparisons too loosely. Um, the Salem witch witch trial, as as you say, um, uh, was led by somebody who was highly educated, but of course a lot of the people who followed him were not, and this was um, not also not a particular Protestant phenomenon, even though they were Protestants. But that could that sort of thing could occur everywhere in in moments of panic, mm -hmm. and um, people are persecuted as scapegoats. But in, in, why? has wokeism uh, become so prominent amongst the, the, the highly educated and um, for well i could think of two reasons one is is perhaps a little more negative than the other um first of all um i do think it fits into that protestant tradition of a self-elected elite um not on the basis of of birth uh, as aristocrats or uh, basis of wealth, but on the basis of superior virtue, um, goes back uh, many centuries. And so um, it's not for nothing that um, wokeism is, is especially popular um, amongst, you know, the privately educated, often white people. But the other reason is, I think that it's, there's an element of guilt, perhaps, but that in a society which is extremely uh, unequal, and where the the gap between the rich and poor is growing uh, every day, uh, it's simpler to affirm your virtue um, in linguistic terms and um, by stressing sort of cultural politics and whether you're, um, you affirm the faith of anti-racism and so on and so forth and have, uh, have enough diversity directors at your private school, it's simpler to do than to pay more tax and put political pressure on 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 the government to have a proper uh, and more equitable um, healthcare system and and public education. So in some ways, it's it's the shift from uh, serious political thinking, which um, involves uh, changing society in very concrete ways, which is expensive and difficult, to. Um, uh, an allegiance to certain cultural dogmas, uh, which is a great deal simple. <laughs> right. Uh, sorry, uh, I think we. I can't hear you. Right. I think we lost our connection a bit, but uh, yeah. Um, I think I I've caught on to what uh, you've uh, said in that there is a growing, I guess. Um, liberal left critique of wokeism um, in that, well, there's the traditional of wokeism being a very illiberal dogma in that it's against um, uh, freedom of speech and fairness and the rule of law and et cetera. But there's also the case that uh, wokeism, while it purports to have to address and fix these social ills, uh, what the method that is pursuing um, does not come close to doing that. And in that respect, um, again, um, you've warned us about uh, using uh, historical analogies, but um, I would venture to say that the Catholic Church's practice that gave birth to the Protestant Reformation, which is uh, the selling of indulgences, also, it also is analogous to, say, uh, paying um, anti-racist uh, consultants and scholars um, tens of thousands of dollars per session in order to for have them absolve you of your um, guilt, so to speak. Would that be a correct uh, yes. analogy? Yes, I think that I, I go along with that. 
Um, when you when you talk about the the liberal left critique, um, I think that's accurate. Um, I mean, one of the, the the salient points of of social activism, as it's often practiced, is that the people who are the victims of um, what people call cancelling are often not far right people or, or even Republicans, but often liberals. So at universities and schools and museums and foundations and so on, it's often liberals who get ousted uh, by people who are more zealous. And um, zealousness is, of course, is never liberal. But there's also a, a left left critique of uh, a socialist critique uh, of this kind of um, uh, social justice activism, which is that uh, the social justice movement um, buries the question of class under the, the question of race. And um, one person I, I quote in the piece, because I agree with him, is Adolf Reed, who's a black uh, intellectual, a Marxist, and he thinks uh, that if you blame all social ills on systemic racism, uh, it becomes much harder to find a political solution to um, economic uh, inequality and so on from a left-wing point of view, mm -hmm. because he feels that class should very much enter the discussion. Mm -hmm. And so speaking of, um, many people on the right uh, equate so wokeism with Marxism. And I think if you read the two, you know, with some scrutiny, you find that it is um, the the differences are just boundless. But um, they but when they mean Marxism, they mean this thing called neo Marxism or cultural Marxism or what the scholars of that school call it critical theory. And there is a certain degree of critical theory in uh, the woke uh, ideas. And another historical analogy I can point to is that. The critical theorists, the, the big Germans, uh, Adorno and Marcuse, are famously not a fan of the American working class. They believe that the working class have been co-opted by the bourgeois society, and it is up to them, as well as uh, people who they believe are the marginalized, to rise up and and change society from within. So would you say that the, the woke uh, ideologues are attempting to do the same thing? Well, I'm not sure about that. I mean, the, the, the cultural Marxism term, of course, goes straight back to the 1930s because the Nazis used the same term. They called it cult cultural cultural Bolshevism mm -hmm. um, in that there was a kind of conspiracy of left-wing cosmopolitan, uh, which was, of course, code for Jews, really, but left-wing cosmopolitanism, com cosmopolitans who were trying to, uh, to undermine racial of or, or national mm -hmm. uh, identity and culture um and i don't think that the uh, that adorno and others um, who did take a sort of a, a marxist view of false consciousness in that in their their view the working class had a, was was as you say was was duped was deluded by the bourgeoisie co-opted by the bourgeoisie and so on um and uh, I'm not sure I recognize that as very much part of, of uh, social activism today, because, um, yes, it's true that some uh, so-called progressives, um, in the words of, of President Obama, uh, consider many working class people to be deplorable because of their love of the church and guns and so on. And that, that certainly does not show a great... Um, uh, support for the for the working class, um, but I think something else has happened, which is because of of culture and identity and so on becoming the focus of politics, um, people forget class altogether and 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 talk about uh, racial identity, and that would be far from the thinking of uh, Adorno and 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 fellow members of the Frankfurt School. <laughs> So I think if we are to be charitable to the umbrella of idea known as uh, wokeism, I would say that the uh, COVID-19 pandemic reveals um, too many uh, social ills that we've uh, 
we've tried to either live with or forget about as we live along, live our lives. Mm-hmm. This uh, disruption of uh, everyday activity and this uh, confinement to our homes and talking to Zoom like this um, for the past two or so years have uh, revealed that, again, there is a huge uh, social as well as wealth gap between the very richest amongst us and the poorest, as well as, especially in America, the uh, overwhelming problem of uh, police brutality when it comes to members of the uh, African-American race. And Mm -hmm. I think the George Floyd protests sort of like burst everything open and and I and it is um it's reasonable to assume that wokeism is uh even though they may have uh bad solutions or methods to solving these ills they're right in saying that these ills exist right absolutely of course I mean and the goals of of uh, Black Lives Matter and 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 Me Too and other things uh, you, it's hard to disagree with them. I mean, we all want um, less discrimination or, or no discrimination, uh, uh, equality, uh, uh, gender of, of gender and race, and so on and so forth. Um, so yes, and uh, that is true. But uh, it's one thing talking about pre- police brutality, which is is a real problem, and not only in the United States. I mean, you know, look, if you just talk about the democratic world, I mean, it's it's a problem in France, as, as we've seen in the last few weeks. Um, but to say that the police are often brutal and discriminatory in uh, minority areas, and particularly in African-American areas, um, should not lead to the conclusion that you should get rid of the police altogether or take away all their funds. And this is where I think the class element uh, shows itself in that the people who often promote uh, not all of them, but many people who promote the idea of defunding the police themselves live in areas which are pretty safe. And the election of the mayor of New York, um, a black ex-cop uh, um, with a lot of support from black voters, I think shows that people who live in, 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 in poorer areas where there tends to be more crime the last thing they want to do is to defund the police. They certainly want the police to behave better, but they don't want to defund it. And this is where I think you see a real gap. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I should say, uh, I think a danger that is inherent in wokeism is the idea that those who practice it, or the ones who are most um, enthusiastic in professing it, um, they exhibit this kind of guilt over the state of their own society. And they believe that because they benefited from the same society that they critique so much, uh, they must be at fault somehow. And that is why um, people uh, people who are of the upper crust of our society buy Robin DiAngelo and uh, Ibram X. Kendi. And mm-hmm. we draw the analogy between um, uh, the Dutch uh, who are colonial slave owners and uh, slave traders and the uh, modern day um, uh, upper class elites, uh, Phil Knight of Nike and Jeff Bezos of Amazon, uh, shilling over all these uh, monies and uh, making a statement of their commitment to diversity while uh, benefiting from unethical business practices, which I find to be very interesting. Yes, I mean, in the, in the case of the, the 17th century, um, uh, elites in in the Netherlands, um, uh, they really did think that they were were people of of superior moral virtue. Um, whether Jeff Bezos and others really think that, I don't know. I think the behavior of corporations, in this case, uh, in the U.S., um, is m- more a sign of how um, uh, adaptable. Uh, and flexible um, capitalism can be, which is why it's so successful. So as soon as there's a social movement, especially amongst the elites, um, capitalists are very quick, or business businesses, corporations are very quick to latch onto it um, and make it into a kind of uh, badge to advertise their their goods. And you know the Benetton ads a while ago are a good example of this. I mean, it was to sell fashion, 
but they use the imagery of racial diversity and so on and so forth to as uh, to to advert to, to 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 advertise their their goods to make money but to look virtuous while they were doing it and uh, this was not so much a question of deep faith as a question of latching onto a movement and and exploit it and uh, you also point out in the uh, article that um, there are people that um, both the left and the right of American society considered the elite. And surprisingly, Donald Trump, who is a billionaire casino owner, is not one of them. So, mm -hmm. so there, so uh, so being member of the elite is not. Uh, entirely dependent on your wealth, although there are very wealthy elite is mm -hmm. dependent on your social attitude and social status. So what do you suppose the, that might be? Well, I think it depends on, 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 on various factors. One, of course, is the level of education. And so um, a professor, university professor, you know, even an Ivy League professor perfect, does perfectly well economically, financially, but nothing uh, even comparable to a man like Trump or an investment banker or something, but they would still be very much part of an elite. And uh, as you say, I think th th that same elite of high education is often urban, um, distinguishes itself from uh, others um, by adopting certain political um, progressive positions. Uh, Trump fit, fits into American society in an awkward way. I mean, he. There have been many people in the past like Trump. I mean, I suppose uh, you know Gatsby, the, the great Gatsby, is an example of this. But he's socially sort of an outsider. I mean, he comes from Queens, from a, a wealthy family of real estate uh, um, uh, people, but. Um, slightly loose um with probably with with mob connections and so on and they were looked down on by sort of older money uh, in manhattan and uh, and certainly felt that snub and so uh, in that sense even though many members of the elite in manhattan didn't mind going to his parties uh, you know when he was riding high um, he was never really accepted as a member of the elite. And so I think his sense of class resentment is real. And it's one reason why he uh, connects with a lot of his supporters who are neither New Yorkers nor wealthy, but share the same resentments, who feel that the elites are looking down on them, that the elites do everything selfishly for themselves, that they're not listened to, and so on. So it's not just cynicism that, that gives... Trump, uh, or that's made Trump popular with a, a large number of people who are unlike him in every possible way. Uh, it's also because he they're on the same wavelength, the same wavelength of resentment, that is. Mm -hmm. I, I remember that uh, in the 90s, there, uh, in the uh, Bush-Clinton presidential race, there were two figures that stood out as a uh, quote-unquote anti-establishment. One is Ross Perot, and the man was a billionaire tech mogul and like Trump, he is considered anti-establishment because he voices statements that are contrary to, I guess, the globalization ethos, so to speak. And the other being Patrick J. Buchanan. And that man, before he became an anti-establishment figure, <clears throat> he served under Nixon and Reagan. So he had right-wing Republican establishment written all over him. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, these figures are considered anti-establishment and I wonder if the Venn diagram between uh, anti-establishment ethos and um, op opposition to globalization financially and culturally, uh, uh, does that uh, include a lot of overlap? Well, yes, uh, including in the Republican Party, of course, because traditionally, um, like all big parties, especially in two-party systems, uh, the Republican Party is a very broad tent and it, it it was dominated by uh, very much sort of an East Coast and sometimes Californian elite of lawyers and businessmen and bankers and, and so on, uh, who 
uh, had conservative um, economic policies, but were socially relatively liberal. Uh, and then you had a sort of nativist, uh, far right, populist wing that uh, resented um, the class of bankers and financiers and lawyers and, and, and so on. And that's, of course, the wing that Pat Buchanan belongs to. And that's the wing that now dominates, um, exploited by Trump um, and exemplified by uh, a lot of senators and congressmen who, um, you know, are, are populists. And, and a populist, of course, is by definition somebody who is hostile to what uh, they see as the as the elite. <laughs> and I think what makes um, radical politics, whether it is the far left or the far right, um, so popular, so dangerous, is that they are able to, um, I guess, uh, they are able to pay attention or to get people to pay attention to certain issues that are very real and very substantial that uh, they allege that the elites, uh, liberal or conservative, are not talking about. And in many cases, there are issues uh, uh, plaguing um, American and or Britain society that that people who are uh, people who are of the elect or people who are of the elite do not wish to talk about, say, um, the issue at hand is immigration, for example. Um, mm -hmm. The Brexit movement happened before, because uh, uh, there were there were a huge constituency of Britons who are uh, who are flabbergasted or discontented at the how the free movement of labor uh, displaces their jobs and livelihood, especially those living in the north and in America. Those who are living in the south of that country are. Uh, frustrated at the overflow of, say, people who come in the country illegally. Um, nevertheless, I think if we are to if we are to push back against the tide of radicalism, we must find a way to address these issues, but with a modicum of moderation. Yes. Well, I I certainly agree with that. Um, but of course, sometimes. Um, the, these problems are well. First of all, they're they're often grossly oversimplified, mm -hmm. um, and uh, but that doesn't mean that they don't exist. I mean, there is an immigration problem, but many people who vote for Trump and who are very anti-immigration and, and, and refugee um, in their daily lives would barely ever come across one. So um, it's 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 one of those th things that people are frightened of, even when there's no, really no need for them to be frightened of them. Um, in Britain, uh, a lot of people voted for Brexit, as you say. That one of the ostensible reasons is that they were worried about too much immigration, um, even though immigration now is higher than it was before Brexit. Um, but it was also that it's one of those things when people feel anxious about many things in their daily lives, they feel they have no grip on the way the world is changing. They feel that uh, inequality is, 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 is becoming a serious problem uh, and so on and so forth. Populists score when they can come up with a very simple solution and a simple scapegoat. And it's too, of course, much too simple to say the elite is responsible for the fact that, you know, there are too many immigrants or that the EU makes too many laws or uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so the solution is worse than the problem itself in the end. Um, so it's not so much that more moderate solutions have to be found, which is, of course, true, uh, but it means that people on 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 the sort of on the left on the liberal left have to take these problems seriously and if you don't take them seriously you can't find any kind of solution and not just to dismiss anxieties about uh, mass immigration and so on as racist uh, you have to admit that it, it may be a problem uh, and then try and find a way to and uh, resolve it. I think um, another key topic or subject that the woke movement has touched on other than the topic of race is uh, what they call LGBTQ advocacy. And 
we recently went past the month of June, or as all of the big companies would have you to believe, uh, Pride Month, and um, they they certainly believe that uh, uh, right now uh, their focus is on um, the transgender population, and I see that is this is the first time maybe maybe historically there have been other examples where one rights advocacy group is clashing with other rights advocacy group in this case uh, the transgender population versus say uh, feminists of the jk rowling variety mm -hmm. and i think this is where wokeism runs into trouble because um uh, they purport to fight for social justice whereas uh, they disagree perhaps very vehemently with those who are uh, also fighting for social justice for a particular group yes no i think that's that, that's right um i think people of of uh, jk rowling's generation of feminists um feel that they've been um fighting for equal rights and for women uh, and 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 so on and um but and want to be recognized recognize that these that there are issues that that are specific to the experience of or their experience of being women and that being a woman is not simply a matter of choice it's something that that often is something in which you have no choice because it's a matter of birth now that merges with the idea that uh, subjectivity should trump um, uh, facts and um, so those who's not everybody who claims that they are uh, a different gender than the one they were supposedly born into, that, that they're in the wrong body, um, those feelings are perfectly, can be perfectly real and legitimate. But that's not to say that there are no biological differences. Now, not all of them would claim uh, that there are no biological differences. And they would say there is a difference perhaps between sex and gender. But to many of them, uh, even questioning uh, the, posi the, the, the position that feeling is all, I feel I'm a woman and therefore I am a woman, uh, and completely uh, disregarding any kind of bi biological difference, even questioning it means you're transphobic and so on. And that's, of course, what happened to, to J.K. Rowling. Now, in my view, the, the the solution to that is to to separate two different categories of knowledge one is is feeling and subjective knowledge namely i'm a woman because i feel i'm, I'm a woman and the other is uh, is biology and just don't confuse the two that that there is le there are legitimate claims on both sides but they're not the same and they're not based on the same same thing and I think a, con a confusion of those categories is 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 a mistake. Uh, the other th thing I think that your question touches on is that there are far too many broad brushes. Too many people are assumed to be part of a community who are not really a community. I mean, people of color is all is so broad that it's almost meaningless. Uh, it, and again, it disregards. Uh, economic inequality, class education, and so on and so forth. Even a concept like Asian American is almost meaningless because there are so many differences between uh, not only diff Asian Americans from different cultural and national backgrounds, but also, again, class backgrounds and, and, and so on. It's not that the, the interests of all Asian American are identical. And so even to speak of it, use the word community can be misleading and this is again why i think you get a lot of tensions um amongst people who are ostensibly all part of what social justice activists are supposed to be defending yes and so we're talking on uh, july the 10th and um uh, so last month later last month there was that uh, supreme court verdict that um, strike down substantial portions of the uh, race-based affirmative action scheme that um, Harvard and other uh, elite universities are were practicing at that time, students for fair admission versus Harvard. 
And I think uh, even though you know, uh, many in the uh, more liberal leaning publications may find that to be an occasion of shame or lamentation, I think there is um, there is a cause for celebration among say people who are of the left since um, um, there since uh, the uh, race based affirmative action program that is being practiced they well one they benefit um, legacy uh, admission students uh, and also uh, people of color but they are only those who are of the upper crust of the society so mm -hmm. for example someone who is the uh, son or daughter of an uh, African leader uh, has more advantage than, say, a white American, but who is of the uh, working poor, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a cause for concern because um, in the in the woke ideology, race, uh, racial diversity is uh, is being sacrificed. Uh, no, is uh, being promoted. Uh, while sacrificing uh, class diversity, right? Yes, I mean, one of the problems with focusing so much on race is that it doesn't distinguish enough uh, between uh, people in different social situations. Um, if you simply treat everybody who is black as part of the, of the same social category, you fa you fail to see the differences, for example, between African immigrants um, who are often very successful in the United States, who don't have a, a, a who are not the descendants of slaves, and the very particular problems uh, faced by the African American community, but which which has have deep roots in history, and we all know know about, and th there's clearly a lot a lot to be done about uh, that problem, um, and uh, so. I think that in affirmative action, uh, affirmative action, there there is something to be said for taking into account the particular problems that African Americans, the descendants of slaves, have faced uh, in terms of educational opportunities uh, and and so on. By getting rid of affirmative action entirely, but allowing still, and this this is. Uh, obviously not an original idea of mine, but it's something that a concern that has been voiced already here and there, and but still allowing people to give a personal account of ways in which they may have been disadvantaged um, opens the door to a different kind of abuse, namely that all students who want to get into a good school become more or less skilled in writing uh, their own letters of reference in which they sometimes make up uh, the way that they were deprived and so on for all kinds of reasons. And um, that's obviously not, not desirable either. So you have to find some kind of way in which you can try and um, uh, involve or get, get as many people from deprived backgrounds um, which and those deprived for many different reasons, for economic reasons, historical reasons, uh, social reasons, and so on, uh, to to get them into the mainstream um, without completely abolishing all uh, distinctions, or um, encouraging students to write more or less bogus statements about how deprived they've been. So. Uh, uh... So segueing into another topic, one of the uh, main uh, features of world, of world culture that you mentioned in your essay is the public apology. And this is where the difference between Catholicism and Protestantism comes in, in that uh, in the Catholic faith, you make your confession privately to a priest. But in Protestantism, you are often called upon by the public, often by a preacher, to voice your confession, voice uh, your testimony. Um, yes, and um, and there, so and is analogous to how a public apology is often called upon or even demanded by um, the woke crowd, so to speak, in order to be absolved of one's is uh, sin, real or imagined. So. How do you suppose uh, the importance of this uh, public apology in today's uh, culture? Well, I think it's it's very important because 
um, as anybody who who watches uh, TV evangelists on on TV sees how this works, that people have to come forward and confess their sins and fall on their knees, and then they're allowed back into the flock, and and they'll be forgiven. And uh, obviously, in in the in the social justice world, uh, this is not all about falling on your knees uh, to find favor with God, but it is about falling on your knees to. Uh, affirm uh, the faith in certain dogmatic positions and to apologize for having strayed from it and so it's it's a pseudo religious uh, pseudo protestant um uh, form of behavior mm -hmm. and you've also mentioned how make the connection between how protestants think of sin as well as how um wokism today think of what they deem as sins or cancel board fences in that you make a quote from, I believe, um, uh, Weber that um, the, this consciousness of divine grace of the elect and holy was accompanied by an attitude toward the sin of one's neighbor, not of sympathetic understanding based, based on consciousness of one's own weakness, but of hatred and contempt for him as an enemy of God, bearing the signs of eternal damnation. Mm -hmm. I think um, this is why uh, I guess in the woke mindset is not it's not just uh, important that I am a believer of all of these tenets. Uh, you have to be a believer too and you have to exhibit it uh, in every waking moment. Well, if you think of the Catholic Church and confession in the Catholic Church, I don't want to be an apologist for the Catholic Church. I'm not a Catholic. Mm -hmm. And there's obviously a lot wrong with Catholicism and the history of Catholicism. But one thing that confession does recognize is human weakness, human foil foibles. Everyone is, is liable to sin in one way or another. And by confessing your sin, uh, God forgives you through through the mediation of the priest. Um, and so it it recognizes that that committing sins is part of of humanity. I think that the, the more puritanical uh, Protestants and um, some of the people today in, in in social in the social justice movement um, uh, have. A, a, well, they are more puritanical in the sense that they think that if you have, first of all, they think that you can be um, uh, tainted by the original sin in the case of race debates by being a member of the white race, which already means you're complicit in a, a, a great wrong. Um, but it also suggests that by constant re reaffirmation of the faith, by constant doing the work, by constantly um, working on your anti-racism and so on, uh, you can become one of the blessed. And any lapse from that um, means you're a, one of the damned. And that is, I think, uh, would be alien to uh, a non-Protestant way of thinking. And I think one of the things I'm quite worried about is there is a rise of um anti-woke dogma and you can find it um more often on the right than on the left and currently the face of anti-woke politics is uh governor ron DeSantis of florida yes and um you know uh, and it is uh quite it's quite apparent that he is willing to uh uh enact illiberal policies in his pursuit of anti-wokeness and and because of that he's currently courting a substantial following on the right. So I wonder if you yes. share this concern of mine. Well, that, that's of, co of course I share that concern. Uh, and in many ways, what he does, he, he mirrors some of the worst aspects of the liberal left. And what you said earlier, that there are, uh, that even um, illiberal, uh, radical right-wing populists uh, sometimes touch on things, problems that are real, uh, that that can be true of some of the things that Ron DeSantis says as well. But he, of course, he exploits woke, but he uses woke in such a 
a vague term that it just means everything that people think they hate and it's it's not very clearly defined but yes it's 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 a serious problem uh it undermines uh, faith in the united states in um federal institutions it undermines faith in uh in any kind of authority in in in, in education in the educated elites etc cetera, etc cetera. and um uh, so and it, it 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 turns politics which in the end should be about resolving conflicts of interests uh in a rash, reasonable and uh, way it turns politics into uh, a kind of game of um a moral game of, of of friends against enemies and that's inimical to any kind of liberal democratic system and so it's very dangerous but the answer to that on the left liberal side is not to double down on woke. It's to uh, withdraw to some extent from cultural politics, or at least shift to some extent back from cultural politics to uh, what I would see as more serious politics to do with the economy, with education, with health, and uh, and, and and so on. Because the more the left gets stuck in woke, the more it gives ammunition to uh, dangerous politicians on the right. Mm -hmm. I would say another figure that uh, has garnered a substantial following on the right is um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And I think um, a, a good number of people who say that they are anti-woke also professes to believe the same thing as um, Robert Kennedy Jr. is, um, is good at professing right now, i.e. profound skepticism towards vaccination and the idea that um, our support for Ukraine against Russia is highly dubious and it is uh, just relaunching the Cold War and all that. Um, and so another danger that I'm very much concerned about is the idea that anti-wokeism, uh, the mindset is being bled over to all of these other issues that are in many ways not related to wokeness at all simply because they believe that the people who are woke believe in these things yes because that i mean it all fits in with a particular kind of populism i mean that what what people like kennedy and and, and others whether on the far the far left or the far right um think is that anything that the elite espouses um is hateful and has to be opposed so if the it's 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 a rebellion against expertise, it's a rebellion against authority, it's a rebellion against education. So if the educated elite believe that uh, people need to be vaccinated in order to get rid of the pandemic, you will then take the position: well, that's wrong because it's you know it's it's those people in New York and so on who are trying to um, to to um, to dupe us or trying to dominate us or whatever it is. It's the same with climate change. It's the same with uh, supporting the Ukraine. These are all positions by and large held by people who are quite well educated. So those who hate people simply because they're better educated will um, revolt against those ideas for that reason alone. Mm -hmm. okay. so, um, so I think a, a good strand of philosophical anti-liberalism uh, coming from the right is actually um, is being professed by people who are very devout Catholics. Um, I think of uh, Patrick Deneen and Saurabh Amari and Adrian Vermeil. These are highly educated intellectuals and they believe that there needs to be a, a new elite that is uh, less liberal and um, more traditionalist I think they're talking about themselves, but nevertheless, they do touch on the a criticism that today's elites are, whether they are conservative or liberal, are not very responsible in that they they claim to solve these um, social ills, but they but their manner of um, professing them or their manner of living um, uh, is an offense to people who are profoundly affected by these social ills themselves. So I, think, I guess uh, on this final note, um, how would you um, how would you uh, critique these sort of like anti elitist elitist crit criticisms all the while um, acknowledging that our elites have been irresponsible in many aspects? 
Well, all elites will make mistakes and are irresponsible in, in various ways. And, and the uh, distrust of elites, of authority in general, um, of course, is not just uh, a woke phenomenon. I mean, it's, it, it also has to do with social media, with the breakdown of uh, authority or the, or the faith in authority um, in, in many, many different uh, ways. Uh, the Catholic influence or the far right Catholic influence is what baffles me as a non-American citizen um, is how little attention has been paid to that because it's very weird that a country that whose founding fathers were on the whole almost all Protestants whose elite culture has been Protestant whose dominant culture has been Protestant how enormously influential in the last 10 years or so um, the most reactionary wing of the Catholic Church has become. And at one point, the, the Attorney General was a far-right Catholic. The, the majority of the Supreme Court are, are, far, are, are right-wing Catholics, um, uh, and so on. Um, and uh, this, of course, does go, go back to fissures in, in uh, the United States that, that go back to the founding fathers, that those who were, there were people, Christians, not Catholics at the time. In fact, they were anti-Catholic, uh, but Christians who, dis, who disagreed with Jefferson uh, that church and straight state, the authority of church and state should be separated. And Catholics are uncomfortable uh, with that, have always been uncomfortable with that idea. And reactionary Catholics, we very much like to break that distinction down. And uh, that's what we've been seeing in right-wing politics. Uh, I mean, there are many aspects of right-wing politics, but that's one of the strands of right-wing politics is this uh, assault on uh, the separation of church and state. I think uh, on that note, uh, thank you very much, Ian Bruma. Thank you. Program. That was a great discussion. Thanks. Take very good care of yourself. Bye-bye.